and by our whole choir and Patricia and everybody. You know, I'm using as a theme this month uh, the joy of service, and uh, I just am so always touched by what it takes to create and sustain spiritual community. And um, so many people serving in so many ways. Most of it's all behind the scenes and never seen, and we can never acknowledge it enough. Um, and then when we start to acknowledge it, then it's like four hours. But you know what? I get an extra hour today because, you know, you guys don't know what time it is, so we'll do it. No, um, it's always fun. Daylight savings time is always fun. We'll see who, who else shows up today, you know, at, for the peace song. Um, <clears throat> it's all good. But I'm, I'm touched because... In what what drew me, I think, to spiritual community was that I was looking for something. And I had tried the things that I thought would bring me at least fun, if not joy. Um, that's why I think I relate to St. Francis, because he was a bit of a wild child in his early years. And um, thought that he would experience the fullness of life through all the ways people commonly want to experience the fullness of life. And so he wasn't experiencing the fullness, so he thought, well, maybe I'll go deeper. In other words, maybe I'll sin more, you know? Maybe I'll have more sex and more booze and more, you know, all of it, because maybe that will fill me. It turns out that didn't get him there either. And so he began a a conversion experience in search of what is it that provides joy? What is it that provides peace? What is it that provides fulfillment of our soul? And through interesting things that happened, he had what we would call a mystical experience where the veil was lifted, where the common boundaries no more, and he began to experience, rather than trying to have an experience of God through the church or have an experience of God through worship, the experience he had was he had an experience of God by being God. In other words, when the veil is lifted and we see that there's no separation, there's no longer a sense of God and me, but God as me and God is all creation, then the experience happened for him that he heard the voice of God in the chirping of the birds and felt the breath of God through the wind and the weather. He had an experience of God in all things, which is what that experience that led to him sharing his teachings was all about. Now, we think of him today as the one who communicated with the animals because he did. Because he no longer sensed himself as separate, but he was having an experience of the divine. You see, we often talk in, in our teaching about, many of us go through a, a process, I think. I certainly did. The experience of God is out there. God in heaven. God, the person judging and rewarding and controlling and all that stuff. And then as we go through the spiritual journey, we begin to realize that God is not something outside of us. That rather, this divine presence is the very presence, the very essence of who we are. And so our healing takes place not in having God do something for us, but in the recognition of the divine as already self-existent and self-present. So when we can see that, we can see the holy perfection of all things. We see the beauty of one another. We see the divine in all things. There can no longer be separation. In St. Francis's experience, then he began, of course, anyone who has that experience of the divine in such a profound way attracts others to them. We want what they want. You see, the spiritual teachers through the ages had that 
awareness, no matter what they were teaching. You see, what they're teaching to me is less important if they are experiencing what they are teaching. You know, my teacher, Ernest Holmes, uh, I always call him my teacher, although I never personally met him, um, often would say, don't listen to what I'm saying. Listen to what I'm listening to. Right? And so when we're in that place, when we're in that sense of oneness with the divine, it is far less important the words that we use the path that we take as it is that we're having the experience of the divine. So naturally, started, people started being attracted to this kind of eccentric and crazy guy who was healing and, and you know, the parents were concerned, right? You know, think about it. Your kid goes and starts studying with a guy that's talking to the birds and uh, listening to the breeze. Uh, you know, you're like, mm, not so much, right? Especially given the time. But an order established around him, and so eventually he had to go to the Pope because he had an order. Now, for those, I'm not a Catholic, but I know a little bit about the Catholic Church. You don't do a lot without the Pope's approval for long. <laughs> and so eventually this order uh, became sanctioned through the church and became an order of that, even though they weren't teaching strict doctrine as it had been known. But I believe even the Pope had an experience of this person who knew his one was with God. You see, for me, when I study the life of Jesus... My experience is this is one who knew his oneness with God. And therefore, his teaching was all about helping us understand our oneness with God. Right? Over years, over time, we tend to separate ourselves out. And so... It's intriguing to me that after all of these years, so often people think that Jesus is the way to experience God through Jesus. Now, I'm not, everybody gets to have their path. I'm good. I'm not saying one's right or right, what's wrong, but I'm saying I think what Jesus was saying is you can have a direct experience of the divine. And so while the laws, the Jewish laws that we all practice are important, what is more important is not what goes into your mouth, but what comes out of your mouth. Right? Wow. That's profound. You see, sometimes we get into our, our path, our spiritual practice, and we start to think that the practice is the thing. Sometimes even in our, in our physical things, we think, oh, my, my diet is my thing. Or my way of worship is my thing. When the truth is all of those things are simply designed to help us know who we are. And when we know who we are, all things flow from that awareness. Isn't that good? Isn't that good? So St. Francis was one who knew who he was. And so he would speak to his brother, the sun, and his sister, the moon. And all of life as a part of who he was. In unity, this will come as a shock to you. In unity, we believe in oneness. <laughs> we threw it right into the name just so there was no confusion, right? And I think it's fascinating because so often when I experience challenge in my life, it's because I'm not experiencing unity. I'm experiencing separation. Or I'm experiencing my belief in separation, isn't it amazing that we can say, I don't believe in God, and yet our heart keeps beating and our breath keeps breathing? Oh, it's like me saying, I don't believe in gravity. <laughs> gravity really doesn't care. Not, not particularly interested. If I step off a cliff, gravity still exists. God still exists whether we choose to believe in that. Now, sometimes our definition also gets in the way. But when we start to experience that there's one life, 
ever-present, always available, seeking its expression in, through, and as all creation, and we are its beloved creation, then our process is different because we're not trying to overcome something. Rather, we're trying to allow something. We're allowing God to be God in me. So we chose as a, as a theme, kind of as a unifying theme as we move forward as a community, this idea around if we could break it into three words, what would those three words be? And we came up with love, grow, and serve. Good, huh? Tell you. Love is that love, the unconditional type of love that's often referred to as agape. You see, the Greeks were really good because they had like six or seven words for love, meaning different types of love. We use one. Love your sweater, love you. <laughs> okay. Cool. You know, it's nice to have a little definition in, in there and what we're talking. But agape is that highest form of love, that unconditional love, the love of the divine. And the love of the divine is grace, we might call it the self-givingness of spirit in and through and as all of creation. And so we are seeking as individuals, as a community, to experience divine love, to open our hearts, to love one another. Jesus said to us, he, he really broke it down. He said, love one another even as I have loved you. Now, you would think, well, spiritual community should be really good at that. Yeah, should be. <laughs> I agree. I was um, looking for my own place to serve because for me, see, we have like one full-time employee at Unity of Charlotte. Can you guess who it is? A <laughs> couple of really, really part-time people. And then most of what happens here is done through the gracious service and love of one another to the community. And I'm so grateful for that. But, so for me, it's always hard to figure out when am I being of service to the community and when am I doing my job, right? Um, so I found it's helpful for me to have places to be of service outside of the community uh, that's helpful. So for this first year that I've been here, I'm like, I'm kind of busy. Got a lot going on trying to figure this group out. They're trying to figure me out. We're trying to figure out where things are, <laughs> how things work, all that kind of thing. So I, I was thinking, well, I need to now move into some dimension of service so that I'm being of service to the world. And so I signed up to be part of the Pride Festival interfaith service. And so I just had my first meeting with them and said, you know, I'd love to bring different points of view together in worship and in celebration and Welcome and affirm the LGBTQIA. I don't know. They keep adding letters. It's even confusing for me, and I'm supposed to be one of them, you know. But all those folk know that they're loved, they're valued. Well, I don't know if you heard, but the Methodist Church has been having a rough week. And basically, it's, I, you know, having this brought together this whole, their whole convention and decided that they would not allow same-sex marriage or, you know. So they took a step backward, in my humble opinion. So needless to say, that community is trying to figure out who they are, right? Many for, many against, having that conversation. And so it's, it's always lovely to say, well, when we're in spiritual community, all is well, all is light, all is love, all is beauty. And yet we have a group of people who are together having their own opinion, trying to figure it out. So I just, I'm, I'm witnessing this and just bearing witness because I remember even in our community, we went through some difficult times in terms of as the progression of thought move forward around should we be engaged in same-sex unions before it was the law of the land. And so, you know, we, we work these things out. So I'm, I'm uh, humbled to actually be part of that experience because I think, for me, the more dialogue that takes place 
of our differences is what allows us to experience our oneness. You see, too often we allow our differences to divide us instead of seeing our uniqueness as the way that the one has shown up uniquely. So for me, as I move into this unconditional love of all people, I recognize the, the beauty of humanity and the oneness of, of spirituality and that every person, whatever the labels that they've hung on themselves or others have hung on them, are divine in nature. That's a beautiful thing. Our world is still in so much need of healing. The country feels very, very divided to me. And it's because we keep going to this place of right and wrong and left and right and... Uh, right? So that unconditional love is what we're seeking to know. That I honor and love each individual in the world as a child of God. Now, just because everyone's a child of God doesn't mean we should condone their childish behavior. <laughs> right? Right? If you love your kid, at some point you've got to say, I love you, honey. But no, this is not the behavior we're going for, right? So I often think that sometimes when we, we start saying, well, I'm just going to love everybody unconditionally, it's like somehow I'm setting my brain aside and not paying attention to how you're showing up in the world. Not so. It is, I love you and I differentiate between the essence of who you are and the way you are behaving. Right? right? So people who are unhealed tend to project their unhealedness upon the world. Yeah. Right? That wonderful line of get better, not bitter, don't be bitter, get better, whatever that line is, is right. Rather than take your hurt and your wounding and project it and hurt and wound others, we do our own healing so that we might be a blessing to others. You see, St. Francis went through this conversion experience when he no longer sought the divine because he was the divine. And so when he was living from that place, then everything changed around him. He communed with all things. He saw the divine. He saw God in all things. This is our work. So we love one another. So grow, obviously, comes from the awareness that if we're not in that state of unconditional love, of perfect peace, of joyful abundance all of the time, and we further realize that we're no longer holding on to a belief that God is withholding our good from us, right? Anybody ever believe that? God wasn't going to let me have what I want? Right? In our early experience of God is separate, then yes, God's either rewarding or punishing. But when we see that the divine is being the divine in and through and as all of creation, then we realize that the blockage is not in God, but in me. In my belief in separation. In my belief in not enoughness. In my belief, whatever my limiting belief is, it is manifesting it in my world. So growth comes in learning the spiritual growth comes in, in our unifying experience of God as me working through me and I'm working with God in all ways. If you step into the unity room this afternoon for a healing treatment, it's not because they're doing voodoo on you. Are you? I'm, I should check. You're not doing voodoo on them, are you? Okay, didn't think. They're recognizing the divine energies that exist and calling that forth. That's what healing is about. It is the recognition of spiritual truth and reality and calling that forth. When Jesus was walking among the masses, he was not bringing a superpower to them. He was, well, he was, except that it's a superpower common to all. He was simply recognizing the spiritually inherent wholeness of people and calling that forth. And then taught us that greater works than these we can also do, which would mean that we have the same power and the same capability if we learn and grow and evolve to that place. So that's what we're about, a growing into awareness of who we are and living from that state. And then lastly, this idea of being of service. You see, I, 
have watched, I've been doing this a long time, um, and I've watched a lot of different people come into the teaching. And I watch those who come in seeking something, and often they find it. And that's a beautiful thing. That's a beautiful thing. They start to know who they are. They realize they have uh, the power of affirmation, the power of co-creation, the power to create the life they want. And then often they then get what they want or get what they think they need, and then they go off and do their thing. For me, the circle is completed when we grow and then we serve. When we can take what we have learned And give it to the world. So St. Francis had this mystical experience and became a mystic and had an experience of the divine in all things. And and the temptation, I think, would be, I'll just go hang out. Listen to the breeze. Listen to God in the, right? But rather, he chose a path of service, which was not a comfortable path, wasn't everybody wanting me? Oh, let's have a parade. St. Francis got it. In fact, he was treated rather poorly, as most mystics are. <laughs> um, but his path was one of service. You see, once we get it, I think we not only have, I think we have a responsibility to share it. Right? What good is it if we know the truth, if we're not living that truth and modeling that truth for others in search. So I think 12-step programs have it best. I think that's why it's become such an amazing phenomenon in our world is because, um, as I understand it, you don't get to be a sponsor while you're still a drunk. (laughs) I understand it. Correct me if I'm wrong here. You kind of have to do your own work. And once you've done your own work, once you've become sober and you've had that relationship with that higher power and you've done the things, then you are a service to others to help share the path. Not to do their work. You know, sometimes we get spiritually aware and then we think, well, I'll do your work for you. No. These are the early missteps that we make in the path of service. Right? So for me, the completion or the fulfillment of, spiritual, of the spiritual life is serve graciously. Now, in the next hour, because I've got this extra hour this morning, let's talk about what that means. <laughs> uh, we'll do it next week. But let me give you a couple hints. A couple, right? So service is not martyrdom. Serving wisely is recognizing that the service that I provide must be not only a blessing to those that I serve, but to myself. See, this is where churches get it wrong so often. We have a need. Will you serve this capacity? Would you serve in our youth room? I hate kids. Great. Do you have a breath? We'd love to have you. That always works out so well, right? Love to have you be in our choir. I can't sing. Doesn't matter, right? Come, right? It's where do you find your joy? You see, I went into this path of ministry because I said, I like kids. I didn't know I was stepping on the path of ministry. I just thought I liked kids and I could give a Sunday morning, you know, hang out. And it changed my life because I found joy and fulfillment in the service that I was providing. So, <clears throat> make sure that when you serve, the way you serve brings you joy. Not every minute of every day all the time, because that program I don't think exists. But overall, it brings you joy and fulfillment. Maintain balance. Sometimes, and again, it's always good, we'll talk more about this, always good to look at what is my motivation <coughs> for my service. If we still harbor a belief in our not enoughness, then sometimes our service can be one more way we try and prove we're okay. Something just to be aware of. 
And lastly, recognize that service is a cycle. To be a good server, we must allow ourselves to be served. Anybody freaking out right now? You don't have to raise your hand. <laughs> right? Because some of you are really good givers. I watch you. I watch you. But how well do you receive? You see, in the balance of life, we must learn to not only give joyously, but to receive graciously. For we will all have our opportunity. That's the beauty of life, is that we will all have our opportunity to both serve and to be served. Matthew, er, Jesus said to us through Matthew, Come you who are blessed by my Father, Mother God, take your inheritance. The kingdom is prepared for you since the creation of the world. And he goes on to say, I was hungry, and you fed me, and I was imprisoned, and you set me free. And they're like, what? When was that? And he said, when you do this for the least of these, you have done it for me. Jesus understood his oneness with life. St. Francis understood his oneness with life. Hopefully, as unity students and practitioners, we understand our oneness with life. So I invite you to go forth and serve graciously and wisely and allow yourself to be served. Let us pray. As we simply recognize in this moment this one life, this one power, this one presence, this one divine essence that indeed delights in itself expression in and through and as all of creation. We open our hearts and our minds this day to remember the truth of who we are. That we are divine beings. By the mere fact of our presence, we are divine in nature and in origin. And so this day, we simply are surrendering to that awareness, which is to say we are opening more fully to it. We are allowing God to be God in us, the divine to express through us. We claim this inheritance that has been prepared for us. We claim wholeness and allow ourselves to be free, to experience health and well-being and vitality. We claim for ourselves abundance, for we participate joyously in the divine flow, graciously giving, graciously receiving of this infinite bounty. We can't claim unconditional love as our state of being and allow ourselves to experience peace even in the midst of chaos. We are indeed powerful beyond measure, and so let us be grateful for these gifts that have been so freely given. Let us give thanks for the blessings that are ours. And let us extend those blessings to those who may not know what we know. We bless this spiritual community that it might continue to be a positive force in the world, healing, blessing, transforming lives. And we extend this blessing to our brothers and sisters of all kinds, not only the two-leggeds, but the four-leggeds, for the planet herself. We're accepting an awakening of humanity so that there is peace on earth and that there is goodwill for all, that we are cooperating and co-creating a world that works for all. And we bless all priests and all rabbis, all ministers, all teachers of all faiths. We celebrate the many pathways to the divine. We speak of wor this word of truth for all those requests that have been placed in our ministry of prayer, knowing 
that as it is written before you ask, I shall answer. That it is done for the highest good of all concerned. And so in joy and gratitude, I'm simply grateful for this truth, grateful for the laws of mind that work upon the word spoken here, the consciousness held, grateful for perfect timing and divine right order. And so in profound joy, I release this word, knowing that it is so, and that through the power of the living Christ, it goes forth to be a blessing to all. As together we say, and so it is. Amen. Mm.